Hi, thank you. So I'll just share my slides here. Okay, well, um, hello everyone. My name is Susanne van het Hof de Goede, um, and I'm presenting a paper that I wrote with uh, Rutger Leukveld, Rick van der Kleij, and uh, Steve van der Weijer. And it's about explaining cyber victimization uh, using a longitudinal design from the online behavior and victimization study. So just to start off with a small introduction, of course, we all know that online victimization is high and can have a huge impact on its victim. Um, and in our research group, instead of taking a technical approach, we take a human factor approach towards cybersecurity and cybercrime, in, in this case, explaining online victimization. So who are cyber uh, crime victims? Um, previous studies have, for example, looked at personal characteristics and routine activities, but they mostly have had to conclude that there aren't many uh, particular characteristics or uh, activities, routine activities that uh, people uh, do that automatically uh, increase the odds of becoming an online victim. Um, there is a uh, one factor, for example, is age, but all other factors seem to be very um, have a, a small effect on victimization rates. So what we wanted to do is uh, look at online behavior in explaining victimization. So we think that unsafe online behavior might increase the odds of becoming a victim of cybercrime. However, if you want to research how people behave online, you can't just simply ask them how they behave online because what people say they do isn't particularly exactly the same as what they do online. Uh, and even if you do get them to own up to what they do online, what they think they do still might not be what they actually do when they're online. So we could have done an experiment, um, for example, uh, looking over the shoulder of people while they're online, seeing how they behave. Uh, but these types of studies uh, tend to have a small number of respondents and also a few explanatory factors that they can um, measure. So in the online behavior and victimization study, we've developed an instrument that measured both actual online behavior, uh, in this case of Dutch citizens, uh, so not self-reported, not only self-reported behavior, but actual online behavior, and we've measured cybercrime victimization and other possibly uh, explanatory factors. Um, and a very uh, nice element of the study is that we've been able to use a longitudinal design, meaning that we've measured victimization at uh, two time points. So in the study, we used the population-based survey experiment, meaning that we combined a online survey with online experiments. Uh, in this, uh, you can imagine people fill out a survey and then uh, without knowing it, they uh, enter certain scenarios where we are not particularly interested in the answer they choose, but the way they behave in that scenario. Um, and in this way, we get the advantages of both. So we can uh, reach a large representative sample of respondents and we can do objective measurements of behavior. So measuring online behavior, we've done that uh, for object objective behavior in three areas. We've measured the use of passwords. So to what extent do people uh, when they're, they don't know they're being tested, what kind of password do they use? How strong is this password? Um, being cautious online, we uh, got them to watch a video. And when the video didn't start playing, we told them they needed to download certain software uh, in order to be able to watch the uh, video. And this uh, uh, software uh, was supposed to alert them of being unsafe from an unknown source and uh, they shouldn't have downloaded the software. Um, and in the final uh, way we measured all objective behavior is we uh, asked them to share some personal information with us. And we wanted to see uh, to what extent they would fill out the answers to certain questions, uh, starting out with just basic things like, where do you live? What's your email address? 
uh, and increasing the privacy value of this information, for example, uh, asking about the last three digits of their bank account, all kinds of information that one shouldn't share uh, with people that shouldn't know these things uh, because they constitute a risk for phishing and spear phishing. And finally, we also did a role play uh, measurement of behavior. We uh, asked people to uh, view um, emails and uh, without telling them this was had anything to do with phishing, we just asked them to say, we want to know how people handle uh, emails and we want to see what you would do if you were this person and these and these was your background, what would you do? with this email and uh, we of course were measuring whether they would click on the phishing link. So this is an uh, example, uh, this is the way we uh, measured password use. Uh, so we told them in accordance with Dutch privacy legislation, uh, we ask you to make a temporary user account. And we told them that their personal information would be stored in this account to make sure that they were motivated to use a password that they would also normally use to uh, store any personal information. Um, and we told them they would need to use the account one more time at the end to make sure they chose a password that they would be able to remember. Um, and at the end of the survey, we did ask them if they did chose a password similar to the ones they would normally choose uh, outside of the study. So on to our sample, we did two waves of measurement. In the first wave in 2019, we measured all kinds of factors, but uh, for this paper, it's particularly interested that we measured online behavior and objective online behavior. And the M was over uh, 2,400 people that filled in the full uh, experimental survey. And then one year later in 2020, we asked them uh, about their uh, online victimization in the year uh, between these two studies and over 77 percent of the people that were in the first wave again filled in our questionnaire and this time we did not measure objective behavior but we did me measure uh, victimization so i want to emphasize that these are very preliminary uh, results we haven't had the chance to um, do a full paper on them yet. So I'm, I'm presenting to you today some very preliminary results that we need to um, look further into before we publish them. Um, this table, unfortunately, I couldn't get it any uh, less uh, uh, huge and uh, invasive on the screen. Um, but this shows you um, the number of people that were victim in the first wave of measurement. So we asked them in the previous year, did you become a victim of these uh, types of cyber crime? And we also asked them uh, if they were a victim, did you have any damages uh, during this uh, victimization? So this could be either financial or emotional uh, material or other. Um, so what you can see is that phishing victimization was about 3% and about half of these people um, reported damages. Uh, mal malware is uh, one of the highest, it's 7.5%, um, including ransomware. Uh, online shopping about 2% and we measured hacking in four ways. And when you add these, they uh, constitute about 2.5% of victimization in the last year. And we also see that damages are quite high. So for almost all types of cybercrime, uh, at least half of the respondents uh, report damages. And for some, like online shopping, uh, it's almost all respondents. Um, and for mm -hmm. identity fraud, it's about 80%. So we asked this again a year later. Um, so the table gets even bigger here. I just wanted to show you that within these same respondents, a uh, victimization for the following year is quite high again. So five and a half percent phishing a victimization, um, twelve percent over twelve percent uh, malware uh, victimization, including ransomware, uh, almost five percent online shopping fraud, uh, and about uh, five percent I think. Sorry, I didn't add that up before. 6% I see, uh, hacking victimization. We also asked about WhatsApp fraud this time. 
um, and 0.5% uh, of victimization is, is the same um, valence that we measured in a different study on WhatsApp fraud in the Netherlands, uh, and 100% there uh, suffered damages. And altogether, this constitutes a victimization rate in the first wave of 13.6%, and in the second wave of 24%, which is uh, quite a bit higher. So now we want to start uh, with explaining victimization. And we uh, looked at uh, all the measurements of data of behavior and how they might explain victimization a year later. So what we found, first of all, is that we add, when we add just the three types of objective measurement of behavior, um, that only password strength was uh, significantly explaining victimization a year later. However, when we added um, control variables, particularly gender, uh, this relationship became non-significant. So both password strength, being cautious online and not sharing personal information do not significantly seem to uh, explain victimization a year later. However, the role playing of uh, emails was a significant predictor of victimization the year after. Uh, so people who did not click on the phishing links in the role play that we did uh, were significantly less often a victim a year later. Uh, and the dependent here victimization is uh, zero for not being a victim and one for being a victim. Uh, and this included controls such as gender, age and education. So I wanted to check this relationship a bit further. Uh, and first I checked maybe a cumulative effect of uh, being unsafe online. So if you use a weak password and you're not cautious and you click on links uh, like that, uh, is that a significant predictor of victimization? Uh, um, yes. So the more unsafe uh, uh, you are, the less victimized you seem to be a year later. Um, however, I do think this effect is strongly pushed by the effect of uh, not clicking on phishing links. So I do have to check uh, if this is really any added value to just adding uh, the clicking on phishing links uh, as a predictor. And I also changed the dependent variable from victimization in the last year to particularly phishing victimization. And then the connection, of course, becomes uh, even uh, larger for not clicking on phishing links. So the next steps for us, uh, there are very many that I still want to do for this study. I want to dive into these relationships. I uh, was thinking about maybe checking uh, repeat victimization between, so I kind of measured them three times. So ever before in the last year during the first wave and in the last year during the second wave. So I might be able to get some trends from that. Uh, I also want to compare self-reported behavior see if that uh, leads to any interesting findings uh, comparing them with actual behavior. I also want to look at some other factors that might be related to both victimization and online behavior, such as self-control and risk perception, um, and all these uh, things we did measure. So it's just a matter of uh, uh, studying them now. Um, and looking forward, of course, what we're, we're, what we're working towards is um, trying to prevent online victimization. So we might be able to make links between our findings and possible interventions uh, for cybercrime victimization. So I think that's about it within time. Luckily, uh, this is my contact information. If you have any further questions uh, after today, thank you for your time.